that V is zero, that means U and V are what? Perpendicular or orthogonal, whichever one you want to, which both are acceptable. If V is a vector in Rn, what does this double lines around V mean? Length, Length or magnitude or norm. Any of those are fine. <laughs> True or false, orthogonal means parallel. False. Orthogonal means perpendicular. Okay, so today we're going to introduce the concepts of distance and orthogonality in a vector space. We'll use these concepts in the rest of Chapter 6 in order to find the closest possible solution to an inconsistent system. Oh, thanks. Okay, so, so at the very beginning of the semester, we were solving systems of equations. Sometimes they're inconsistent. There is no solution. So what we're going to be working on for the rest of chapter six is if there's no solution, if there's no solution that will make a system of all of the equations true, what could make it the closest possible thing to true, right? We got, what could be close enough, right? What's as close as we can get? So that's what all these concepts are building towards. All right, so... We're going to um, fill in the blanks in this sheet together. You're going to help me based on your reading of 6.1. Okay. So U and V and W are all vectors in Rn. C is just a constant, real constant. All right, the inner product of U and V is denoted with what? The dot product, U dot V. Good. And it's defined by what? How do you, what does the dot product mean? Yep. It's U transpose times V. Yep. That's, that's how we have learned how to do vector or matrix multiplication, right? You can also just think of it as multiply corresponding entries and add them all together, right? It's equivalent to U transpose V. So, for example, the inner product of these two vectors would be 1 times 3 plus negative 2 times 4 plus 5 times negative 1, which is, say it again, negative 10. Thanks. All right, the inner product of the um, obeys the following properties. So u dot v is equivalent to v dot u, commutative, right? And um, u dot w plus v dot w, can you factor out a w? Yes, you just have to do it on the on the side that the W shows up on in both of them. So this will be U plus V dotted with W. Oh, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it doesn't matter. Yep, because they commute. All right. C U dot V is equivalent to two other things, right? C times U dot V, or C U dotted with C V, no. Everybody's saying letters. <laughs> um, U dot C V, yeah. Yeah, or C V dot U, same thing. When you take the dot product of two vectors, what do you always get? No. You always get a scalar, and that scalar will always be greater than or equal to zero. The dot product of a vector with itself, right? Of a vector with itself, not just any two vectors. Because you're going to multiply corresponding entries. If both those entries are negative, right, you'd get a positive. If both those entries are positive, you get a positive. You can't have one of each because they are the exact same vector, right? All right, so you'll always get a positive or a zero. And you only get zero if what? If the if V is the zero vector. Yep. <laughs> All 
Okay, so just to um, demonstrate some of these properties here, that we just wrote down a whole bunch of properties. So I have u dot w plus v dot w. We just said that's equivalent to u plus v dot w. And we're going to demonstrate that by picking three random vectors. So um, just give me a, in R2, just to be make this easy, give me a vector in R2. Give me another one. One more. Okay. So now I'm going to calculate two different um, two different expressions, right? U dot W plus V dot W and U plus V dot W, and see if they come out the same. So U dot W, right? So that would be two one dotted with three six plus v dot w, 1, 2, dotted with 3, 6. So this is going to be um, 6 plus 6 is 12. Sorry. Yeah, um, 6 plus 6 is 12. Plus 3 plus 12 is 15. 27. Right? Did I do it right? Should come up to a scalar. Good. All right, so now I'm going to do it the other way u plus v first, and then dot with w. So if I add u and v, 2, 1 plus 1, 2 gives me 3, 3, and then dot that with w, 3, 6. 3 times 3 is 9, plus 3 times 6, 18. 9 plus 18 is 27. So see, so you get the same thing. All right. The length or magnitude or norm, right? So the length of a vector v is denoted by these double bars around v. It's defined by, you take the square root of each component squared all summed up. So this is v1 squared plus v2 squared up to the last component squared, square root of the whole thing, which is equivalent to just saying the square root of v dot with v. So, for example, if I want to take the length of 3, 4, negative 1, and that would be the square root of 9 plus 16 plus 1, which is square root of 26. Okay, so if you square the length of a vector, you're always going to get v dot v. Right, because the length of the vector is the square root of v dot v. Square it, you get v dot v. <clears throat> True or false? The length of a scalar times a vector is the scalar times the length of the vector. A scalar doesn't have a um, yeah, the length of a scalar times a vector, yeah, <laughs> is the scalar times the length of the vector. Right, yeah, and you'd be squaring whatever the scalar is, right, and what if that scalar were that were negative, right? When you square it, it's going to become positive. So this is really close to true. It's false, right? The problem is that it is um, the absolute value is the absolute value of the length of the vector.
All right, so it was false, so we're going to write the new version in symbols. So this says that um, if you multiply a scalar times a vector and take the length, right, that means you could take the length of the vector first, multiply by the scalar. Okay? That's what the original sentence said. And the problem happens is if C is negative, right? Because if C is negative, in the left side of this equation, the C values are all going to end up being squared, and they'll always come out positive. B. It wasn't true, so we're writing it in the false part. Yep. So this was almost true. The problem is that I needed to put absolute value bars around the right-hand side there. Because C could be a negative number, right? That would be fine. That would be the same thing. In fact, that's what I wrote in my notes, and I wrote it differently. Absolute value of C times the norm of V. Yes, the unit vector is a vector that has a length of 1. For example, I want to find a unit vector in the direction of 1, negative 2, 5. So it's a vector in R3, right? 1, negative 2, 5. It just starts at the origin and points um, in the direction of 1, negative 2, 5. But it's too long, right? We want it to have a length of 1. So, yeah, so we find the length of this vector, right? So the length of that would be the square root of 1 plus 4 plus 25 which would be square root 30. And then I scale every entry in the vector by the, that length, right? So we would have 1 over square root 30, negative 2 over square root 30, and 5 over square root 30. So that gives me a unit vector pointing in the same direction. All right, the distance between u and v is denoted by, we write, dist u comma v, the distance from u to v. Um, it's defined by the length of the difference, right? So just like we want to find the distance between two numbers on the real number line, right, the distance between 5 and 12, you subtract them and you take the absolute value if you're just talking about distance and not direction. So we take the norm of u minus v. So for example, let's find the distance between 1, negative 2, 5, and 3, 4, negative 1. So first we subtract them. So I have 1 minus 3 is negative 2. Negative 2 minus 4 is negative 6. 5 minus negative 1 is 6. I've got to find the norm of that. So that would be the square root of 4 plus 36 plus 36, which is the square root of 76. So that would be the distance between the two vectors. Yes, exactly. If you think of them as vectors, they're the di it's the distance between like the tips of each arrow. Or you can think of them as points. Yeah, yep, those are points in R3. Yeah. Yeah, you, I'm sure you've been doing a lot with um, stuff in Calc 3, yeah. So vectors u and v are defined to be orthogonal when u dot v is 0. Okay. So let's come up with two vectors that are orthogonal to each other. Two vectors that when you multi dot product them, you get 0. What do you think? Let's not use zero because it's just too easy. So I need vectors in R3. So I could put some 
So I can do a positive two, one, that's good. And then a zero, sure. Sure, I could have done, yeah, there were other things I could have done, but just so you get the idea. So the when I dot product these, I get one times two plus negative two times one plus seven times zero is zero. So those two vectors are orthogonal or perpendicular to each other. <laughs> so what vector is orthogonal to all vectors? Zero. The zero vector, right? If you dot product zero with anything, you're going to get zero. Zero vector. All right, so the Pythagorean theorem, right, it says that if you're in R2, it says that if you square the legs of a right triangle, you get the hypotenuse squared. If you're in Rn, we can write it a little more generically as a vector squared, the length of a vector squared plus the length of another vector squared equals the sum of the two lengths squared. If and only if it's a right triangle, right? So you have to know you have a right angle in there. U and V have to be perpendicular. All right, if W is a subspace of Rn and Z is a vector in Rn, then Z is said to be orthogonal to W, right? So we're not talking about two vectors now. We're talking about a vector Z and a vector space W, right? So for a vector to be perpendicular to an entire vector space, that means it has to be perpendicular to every single vector in that vector space, okay? So z dot w has to be 0 for every vector w in the vector space w. So if it's perpendicular to every single vector in your vector space, then you can just say it's perpendicular to the entire space. Think of it like in R3. Like you can have a line perpendicular to an entire plane, right? Like I could, if this board is a plane, like I can put a single line that's perpendicular to it. The, the logic behind this is that this, this line that's sticking out of the board here is perpendicular to every single line in the plane. Okay? So it's the same thing here. A vector can be per perpendicular to an entire space if it's per perpendicular to every single vector in the space. No, no, it can work in other ways. Yep. Okay. You could be perpendicular to something in R2. So that's what you were saying, that you need to have a zero in one spot if you're in R3. Yeah. Yeah, in R3, yeah. You, can only, you could only be perpendicular to a plane. Could be perpendicular. Yep. <laughs> No, we'll go up dimensions, yeah. All right, the orthogonal complement of W, okay, we denote it W with a little perpendicular um, symbol, and we nickname it W perp, right? So we call that the orthogonal complement of W. It's the set of all vectors Z that are orthogonal to W. Okay, so W is some vector space. And we can try to gather together all the vectors that are perpendicular to W. And we call that subspace W perp. Okay. So if I was going to write this in set builder notation, I would say, well, W perp, or the orthogonal complement of W, it's the set of all Zs in Rn such that Z dot W is 0 for all Ws in W. Uh, for every, yes. For all or for every, yeah. Yeah, that's why I rewrote it again. I said, and I wrote for all instead of for all is that symbol. 
Okay, so the set, W perp. Okay. It's going to be a set of vectors, right? Turns out to be it is a subspace, <laughs> okay. which means it satisfies all the criteria of subspace. It has the zero, always has the zero vector in it because zero is perpendicular to everything, right? It's going to be closed under addition and closed under scalar multiplication. And it's a subspace of R n. Yeah. Okay. If A is an m by n matrix, then the orthogonal complement of the row space. So I'm trying to come up with all vectors that are perpendicular to every element of the row space. So all vectors that when I dot them with an element from the row space, I get zero. I get zero. So let's let's like um, kind of draw a picture of what we're talking about, right? So here's here's a random matrix: um, one, 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 two, 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 three, three, three. Okay. All right. So what's um? Give me a, a basis for the row space of this thing. The row space, one, two, three, one, two, three. Good. All right. So if I have an element from the row space, one, two, three, I want to dot it with something, which is the same thing as multiplying it by another vector, right? I want to dot it with something that gives me zero. What kinds of elements do I put in there to get zero? Sure. Yeah, I mean, we could figure out what it is, but what question am I answering here? That's the null space, right? The, th all, the set of all things that you multiply by to get zero, that's the null space. I thought Len would get that one. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> all right, so this is the null of A. The set of all things that are perpendicular to the row space is the null space. All right. How is um how is the column space related to the row space? Is a transpose. So if I wrote the column space of A perp, right? I could rewrite that as the row space of A transpose perp, right? And then I already know that the orthogonal complement of a row space is the null space. So this is going to be the null of A transpose. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Good. Okay, so the next one, if theta is the angle between the vectors u and v, then u dot v is the length of u dotted with the length of v, or just times the length of v, sorry, times cosine theta. Remember that from the reading? Yeah, do you think we, we just expressed it as just the length of Is it? I don't think so. I know, but I don't know if it's true. Let's let's pick um one 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 and uh, two negative one four, right? So if I want to take the length, this will be u. This will be v. So I'm doing an experiment because Len is curious if if the length of u times the length of v is the same thing as the length of u dot v, right? That's what you're thinking. Okay, so let's check. Yeah, what's the length of u? Um, root 3. Root 3. Yeah. Yeah, so this would be 1 plus 1 plus 1. And then the length of v will be the square root of 4 plus 1 plus 16. So this is square root 3 times square root. Why did I pick such big numbers? 17, 21. 21. <laughs> All right, three, ti 3 times 21 is 63. So square root of 63. What? 
<laughs> All right, let's dot them together first and then take their length. So this is going to be um, 1 times 2 is 2 plus 1 times negative 1 is negative 1 plus 1 times 4 is 4, 4, 6, 5. You can't take the length of a scalar. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, so it's not the same thing. There's a good, um, a good investigation, though. I like that. So that leads us nicely into this next set of questions. I want to talk about what kind of thing each of these um, things are, right? What flavor? So the inner product or the dot product, the answer always comes out to be a scalar. How about when you take the length of something? The answer is a scalar. How about distance? Scalar also. And then what about if you take the orthogonal complement? It's a space. Yeah, it's not just a single vector. It's every vector that is um, perpendicular to the vector space. So this is a vector space. All right, so that um, leaves you to do some activities on your own.